Hi, folks. Our request has been made by uh, MUFON Symposium that please no um, audio or video recording be made during any of this symposium. If you'd like to get copies, audio or video of the symposium, please see the vendor table over at the UFO Congress. Uh, they'll be happy to supply you. Um, we'll just need your information. They'll be happy to uh, sell you the uh, audio or video recordings of the um, 35th Annual MUFON Symposium. John Greenwald, our MC for the uh, symposium, um, couldn't make it here right now. Uh, he is busy actually um, doing some filming with ABC News uh, for a documentary they're doing, which is a good thing. Um, the more media exposure we can get uh, for ufology, the happier we'll all be. So I am proud and excited to uh, announce our next speaker. Um, that's Stephen Bassett. Uh, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen is a, a political activist. He's founder of the Paradigm Research Group, executive director of the Extraterrestrial Phenomena Political Action Committee, otherwise known as XPAC. He's author of the Paradigm Clock website and a political columnist and a commentator. He's got a lot on his plate. Uh, presently, he is the only registered lobbyist in the U.S. representing UFO ET research activist organizations. Uh, he conducted an independent candidacy in uh, 2002 uh, congressional campaign for the 8th District of Maryland. Uh, he was the first candidate in a federal election addressing the matter of an extraterrestrial president presence and the government in imposed truth embargo on that subject. His motto was and is, if Congress will not do its job, the people will. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Bassett. Boy, I can't say anything here. I hope there's somebody out there. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I want to repeat what I said last night. It, it's a, um, a pleasure to, and an honor to be allowed to speak at this 35th MUFON Symposium at the, basically the world's premier organization on this issue. And uh, I knew they'd get around to me eventually, you know, 35, 45, somewhere in there. Uh, but that's fine. And uh, the reason for that is that your current director, John Schusler, apparently, I have a lavalier, apparently is uh, really got some great plans for this organization and has got some vision and some, uh, some, some energy. And uh, I'm very excited about that. And we're going to be talking about that uh, today. Um, this presentation is not what you would normally expect to, to get at a MUFON symposium. You're going to hear some things that typically wouldn't be discussed here, uh, because I'm not a researcher. In fact, the, 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 the nature of the subject matter would probably kind of be best right at the very end, last thing, you know, before you head for the planes. Uh, but that's OK. What, what I'd like you to do is kind of imagine, if you would, that this is Sunday afternoon, and you're getting ready to go to the planes, and sort of put yourself in that frame of mind, right? But of course, as we know, we have a lot of great speakers going to be talking about evidence and the basic themes of this conference. Now, we're going to start and end uh, with MUFON and this presentation, which is wholly appropriate. I should also warn you that I'm, 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 and anybody who knows me knows this. I'm not someone that writes up you know, eight-page presentations, right? Labors over them for months and months, and then gives up and, and gives profound, eloquent speeches. Um, that's sort of a Playhouse 90 Hallmark Hall of Fame approach. I'm more of the MT video approach, MTV video approach, right? And in and, and some, some measure, I, I don't really actually know what I'm going to say yet. But there's a certain thrill to that, which <laughs> you will share with me. Um, MUFON was founded in May 31st of 1969. Seven, the formal founding, which I think is the incorporation. Obviously, it was a, they were getting together at coffee houses and talking for weeks and months about this. But the point is, it was founded seven weeks before Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And approximately, um, I guess it was 
founded about, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, about nine years before NICAP, which had been taken over by members of the CIA who decided it was time for it to go, eventually shut down. And about a year and a half, almost two years before the suicide of James McDonnell. And it took up the legacy of NICAP, which had the luxury of existing during the time before the truth embargo had all the wheels on the train. It took a while. You know, that, that, this embargo thing is not something you put together in a couple of weeks. It took many, many years. So in the early days, there were all kinds of scientists that were quite comfortable in listening to James McDonald and many others talk about this. They were doing it in their spare time. Uh, perfectly legitimate thing to do. Uh, and uh, it was the heyday. I think at one time, NICAP had 15,000 members. Many scientists and some very notable scientists on their board. Not that we don't have scientists in MUFON, but you understand what I'm saying. It was a different time. And it posed considerable problems for the embargo. And so they shut it down. MUFON took up that legacy and has continued it to this day. And so we have now essentially 48 years of the pursuit of the science of this issue by two major organizations, along with many others, and you know they are, KUFOS and FU4, APRO. Many others have been in and out at one time or another and still exist. As I said before, it is one of the most amazing accomplishments of people in a uh, free state, open society, or closed society for that matter. It is, a, it is the citizen science movement in which hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and, and by virtue of awareness, tens of millions of people committed themselves to a path that would lead uh, to a new understanding of the world, but do so against the wishes and desire of the state, which firmly committed itself to that not happening and used all of the resources that it had within whatever constraints that it faced, and those constraints varied from narrow to large, from behavior that you might not find too, too bad to behavior that you would find abhorrent, and it is on the verge of succeeding. It will be viewed in history that way. Now, I'm going to switch over to the slide presentation. Actually, I'm not going to do anything. There is a team of 40 or 50 people back there with <laughs> NASA equipment, and they're going to switch me to the slide presentation here. I say the slide presentation. I don't really have a big, long thing, you know, with all the fancy stuff that, that carries me through this whole thing. Uh, I, what I have are just a few things that are primarily here for no other reason than to put you in the right mood. It's sort of a Perry Como approach to PowerPoint. <laughs> now, the first thing I want to do is, is that showing my arrow? Yeah, OK. Up there, what this is, this, this is my work, OK? And when I say it's my work, in other words, it's what I do to interface with this, this issue and the people in it. All right, it's, it's my connection, it's my connection, it's my plug-in. It is the political activism in service of the politics of disclosure. And it consists of the Paradigm Research Group, founded in 96, which is the principal entity from whence this, from whence this support comes. Uh, the lobbying registrations are under that DBA. The website, main website is under that DBA. Uh, it consists of the Extraterrestrial Phenomena Political Action Committee, XPAC, founded in 1999. It consists of the Citizen Hearing, which is a project awaiting the largesse of some or individual, a group of individuals to the tune of about $200,000. We're talking some serious change here. Uh, and it consists of the Congressional Campaign of 2000. Come to me. There you are. Called Disclosure 2003. And now includes the X Conference, the first annual Exopolitical Expo, Exopolitics Expo, which is held in April. But I want to, I'm not going to go into all the details there. Ooh, come back. Come back, you little rascal. Uh, I want to talk about Logo just for a second. 
You've looked, many of you have seen this logo many, many times, but you don't know the story behind it. I will tell you now. The letter P is black and white. In fact, it's white on black. All right. Why? Because humans are very preferential to their world being black and white. When you get up in the morning, you really don't have a lot of tolerance for ambiguity. Right? You want that coffee maker to be working, and you want it to make some coffee. If the laws of physics have changed, and the thing won't make the coffee unless you put some sort of turbocharger on it, that's going to make you very angry. You want the water to come out of the shower. If it doesn't, that's very upsetting. You want the car to start. If none of these things work, it's upsetting. And if there's some political reason for that, meaning that while you were sleeping, they passed some sort of law that said that you have to ride your bicycle to work, you're going to get really angry. You want the world black and white. And, you, and even though you know that it is not that way, you operate as if it's that way, and that's fine. Because if you didn't, I think it would be much more difficult to get through this life. This is true of everybody, from the first worlder to the third worlder. Fine. However, occasionally, something happens. Not just anything happening, something profound happens. In our own lives, at any given day, something will happen, and suddenly you're facing shades of gray. You know that. And obviously, that's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is something so profound that it thrusts the entire world and all in it into shades of gray. And if you know anything about the spectrum, a little bit about physics, you, know, you should know that between black and white are an infinite number of shades of gray. And so we come to the letter R, which is a shade of gray on another shade of gray. That's the transition period that we're going through now, and that human race from time to time, or major segments of it, have gone through in the past. It's shades of gray, folks, all the time, right? And it's uncomfortable, and it's irritating, and you don't know what's going to happen. But eventually, that transition will be over, and we'll be in a new paradigm that will allow us to get back to our normal affairs, and our comfortability with the black and white world. But if you notice the letter G, which is represented in black and white, it's not white on black. It's black on white. It's different. That logo represents the entire, is a metaphor for the entire paradigm shift that is underway, in which we will go from a world in which the presence of extraterrestrials is simply either absurd are not even known or acknowledged, irrelevant, to a world in which it is, in fact, a known fact for everyone who has any interest in knowing, with all the implications that it means. Now, the, uh, I named this, this presentation, uh, I believe, Deception, Denial, and Disclosure. And here's why. There's a uh, very fine, I believe she's a social scientist, but she might be Another, another discipline named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who came up with a book many years ago, which I refuse to read because I don't need to, to think about that, right, <laughs> yet. And she is, will always be infamous for, not infamous, she will always be well known for describing the five stages that occur after you're told by your doctor that things are not looking good. <laughs> and would you mind getting your visa out and like paying the bill before you leave? And those stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Right? And it's very cool. If you think about it, it's pretty much true. And some of you have actually been through that. It doesn't have to be death. Actually, any major shock to the system, right? Not your death, but the death of somebody close to you. You will go through roughly those five stages. Well, it occurred to me that this paradigm change that we're undergoing is in a way the death of one worldview and the birth of another. So can we apply this to the death of a worldview? And well, you sort of can if, if you try hard enough. And I've come up with this process. Five stages, five somewhat definable things happen, right? I call it 
the a deed of the fifth power and its discovery, deception, debunking, denial, disclosure. Now, I understand that probably you're wondering why he has this D thing. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> but let's think about it for a second. If you think back, before a paradigm change occurs, first there is discovery. In fact, that happens in the death thing. OK, Kubler Ross didn't include that. First, you've got to discover that things are bleak. Then you start the five stages. But the discovery is non-trivial. So I'm throwing that in. First, you've got to have discovery. Somebody's got to discover something. C certain, certain scientists and uh, amateur astronomers back in the Middle Ages discovered moons around Jupiter, discovered shadows in the sun, and all kinds of stuff. And before you know it, the Catholic Church is having them in for extended stays. <laughs> and then, of course, as we know, Giandano Bruno got to go through that five stages of death thing. Only I think he only had a couple of weeks to, to get it together. So first you've got discovery. Something profound is discovered. Well, we know what that is, OK? It was discovered, well, in a what I consider relatively open way. It was discovered in the 40s. And 1947 is not, in my mind, at least Roswell, not in my mind. It was actually 1947 is the beginning of two things. The Kenneth Arnold Mount Rainier event is the beginning of the modern UFO era. Okay, and This is one of the few times you're going to hear me use the, the word acronym UFO, which I'm slowly stripping out of my life. Not that that says anything about MUFON. MUFON is established. Those initials are parked in there between the M and the N, and that's OK. But when that M and N go away is when I start to get a little twitchy. <laughs> Roswell marks the modern era of the truth embargo. And it happened one millisecond after General Ramey put the call in and said, put out another press release. It wasn't a saucer. It was a weather balloon. That is the beginning of the truth embargo and the public awareness of it. Because they picked up their paper that day and they said, oops, not a saucer. Weather balloon, fabulous. Got to get back to school on the GI Bill, which is OK. No problem there. So you got a discovery, and it's massive. And it, and it tells you many things. But one of the few things, one of the things it definitely tells you is that a paradigm is about to end, and a new one is about to begin. And it is generally the case that when the first thing you have to do when this is, uh, is deception. You've got to go right into deception mode. And that's exactly what they did. Outright deception. Lots of it. All right? And you know much of this. We don't have to go through that. But you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this goes on for a number of years. But then. It becomes not enough, all right? Deception's not enough. People are, well, people are smart. We have public education here. We've got lots of colleges. They go to them, they get their degrees, and they listen to your deception, and they go, oh, that's a load of pate, you know? I mean, that's, forget that. And so they start challenging you and everything else, and you say, that's, uh, OK, this deception thing is good. We need more. You go to debunking. Debunking is not the same thing as deception. Deception is when you tell somebody that a lie. Debunking is when you send out Phil Class to sit next to him on a television show and try to make a fool out of him. That's different, all right? It's sort of, it's sort of a, a proactive deception, but it's really much more. In fact, debunking is a very fascinating field, and it is part of the general larger set of propaganda. And of course, the UFO ET community uh, is as familiar with it as anybody in the world, and we're authorities on it. But uh, it needs to be very deeply analyzed so that its role in our culture can ultimately disappear. Now, after you've done the debunking for a long time and things start to settle down, right? most of the researchers run out of money. Phil Class wins the MacArthur Genius Grant. He's living large. Things look good. So now you're going, OK, I don't really have to get too proactive. What, what do we need to do now? Denial. You go to denial. Anybody says, don't know what you're talking about. 
uh, who are you? Philip Corso, who? I, I, I'm not, what army were you in? Um, just deny it. It doesn't exist. Say nothing. Do nothing. Just straight denial. That's pretty good. Just cruising along, right? And you can stay in that mode. And then one day, it's over. And you get disclosure. And you're looking around and you're going, wait a minute. I was deceiving. I was debunking. I was denying. What's going on here? Disclosure just, just crashed in on me. And it will happen that fast, right? There are a lot of pa parallels between this and, in fact, the, the uh, entire history of the Soviet Union, which is kind of, in a way, a, a paradigm change. The Bolshevik Revolution was pretty paradigmatic for most of the people there at the time. And if you look, this, 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 this whole thing pretty much goes along. You know? And in the end, they were in kind of this period of denial, right? Do we got, we got an economic problem? No. We out of money? No. Right? Can we defeat the United States or at least win the Cold War? No. I mean, yes, no problem. And then, bing, it's over. What? 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 What happened? Gorbachev is doing what? He's talking to who? It's over. Even the CIA was going, it's over? Right? It's dismantled into how many republics? So this is, this is what I mean. We're in the very last phases of the denial thing, OK? And the last step is upon us, disclosure. All right, everything that I do and that stuff you see there and all those things is about getting to that moment. And that moment ultimately is starting, creating, building the next paradigm. It's not a guarantee, by the way. The government's going to announce that there's extraterrestrials here. All right? I can assure you the fun just begins. All right? If you all are thinking I'm going to pack up and go home, all right, it's time to get a life, and I'm going to start take up that gardening I've always wanted to do, whatever. No, oh, no, 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 no. The real, because you see, the new paradigm doesn't come delivered, right? Like a, a, uh, you know, a Philly steak and cheese pizza from Domino's. You're going to have to acknowledge that there's a new worldview, and then you have to rebuild it yourselves. You are literally going to build the world again. Not just you, but the French and the Burmese and the Bangladeshis and the South Africans. Everybody's going to have to do it. There's no alternative. It's not like you can say, hey, I'm going to take a pass on that world building thing. You know? I'm just going to stay where I am. Same job, same this, same that. And I, whatever, you all do your thing. Uh-uh, not going to happen. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a conundrum. It's going to have paradoxes. But it's going to be fun. And in a way, it's going to be a process. I believe I am waiting for someone or a number of people to sit me down, take some toothpicks, open my eyes, you know, tie my hands down to the chair, put on a 4,000 slideshow PowerPoint, and run me through the reasons why what I'm about to say is not true. And if they convince me, I'll be happy to get in front of any audience and acknowledge it. But I believe that this process is the process in which the human race is going to step up and out and enter a galactic reality that ultimately will be profound and extraordinary, yet uncomfortable and difficult. But no one is going to look back right, and say, gee, I wish we could go back to those Hylcean days in the 20th century when all you had to worry about was the occasional world war or genocide. <laughs> Just like none of you are sitting there longingly going, oh, if I could live in colonial America when there was no Novocaine and false teeth were wooden, wow, that would be the time. Nobody's going back, right? Now, if I'm wrong about this, and they're here basically to turn us into some alpaca farm, well, <laughs> sorry. Now, I want to talk about disclosure status here, right? Plus, I also got to check my time, because, man, I can go on. Let me tell you. My watch is not working. What's that say? Who has the time? 15. That's good. What half an hour? All right, good check. All right. Three more hours? Good. I thought it was like two, two and a half. I'll be all right. 
The disclosure status. By the way, I love this image. I've got it on my website. I love this image. Okay. I wish I had a real super duper version of it. You know, it's you know, super high resolution. But I, you know, I think you can see what this is. This person is forcing their eye open. Okay. All right. You get it. All right. Because sometimes that's what you got to do. All right. You force your eye open. This is what Stanton Friedman should have been doing when he was driving down from Albuquerque to Roswell because poor Stanton fell asleep because he's working so hard on this and he travels everywhere. He doesn't get enough sleep, doesn't make enough money, and he was just tired. And he fell asleep and he drove off the road at 60 miles an hour. He woke up upside down in a grove of trees. It took quite a while to get the car out. This was just a couple of weeks ago. I know some of you know it and some of you don't. Why do I raise it? I raise the point because the sacrifices that are being made by a lot of people are quite extraordinary. This is serious business. Lives have been lost. Fortunes have been lost. And we don't have the luxury, in my opinion, of sitting around and waiting for delivery on this issue. What would we have done if we had lost Stanton? Who was going to replace Stan Friedman? But he's OK. He's going to be around for a while. Hopefully, he's going to drive around like this. You know? <laughs> yeah, with his knees, you know, steering with his knees. I love Stan. Okay. He's been at this for almost as long as I've been alive. So disclosure. I'm going to give you the quick disclosure status. I think you're familiar with these gentlemen. All right? This is because you know, I'm going to have a little bit of time. And I'll give you a quick update. So you, you almost need like a playbook here. But I, you got this slide. That's all you got. All right. Here is the 5-6 disclosure update. All right. Ooh. Disclosure process begins in 1992 when the Cold War ends, because that was the number one reason. 20,000 poised nukes between two ideological powers, including submarines offshore that could kill you in about 18 seconds. Nobody was inclined to rush down to the New York Times and blab the whole MJ-12 thing, destabilize the world in civilization, and have to have that on their resume from that point forward. They were patriotic good people. They still are. And they weren't going to do that. Some did come forward. We know that. I mean, there was still stuff happening all the time. But no major breaking of ranks, never. Cold War, it was not allowable. Furthermore, whether you were President Carter, or whether you were uh, Barry Goldwater, or any number of other people, you could do whatever you wanted, but disclosure was not going to happen, period. I'm not going to debate that with, uh, with anybody in government, whether it's good or bad. I mean, hey, you know, we're still here, right? Wasn't that long ago, I'm climbing under my desk, you know, and the teacher's saying, if you just stay under that desk and you put your face, you know, in your hands, after the nuclear bomb goes off, you're going to be okay. And I'm going, I don't like the sound of that. We're still here. They must have done something right. But when the Cold War ended, all bets were off. And the people inside government, there are thousands that have intersected with this issue, started to think this out. And they said, I think I can talk now. And they started talking. This process, this witness, this testimony process is the number one vector driving disclosure toward the ultimate event. All right? There are hundreds of these people. We don't have to go into it. Some of them are here, by the way. I believe, and some, are, and some are speaking now at any number of congresses. But there, 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 are, there are a number of these individuals. That disclosure process begins when the Soviet Union dismantles into the representative republics. And it happens on the watch of George H. W. Bush, all right, who is the vice president under Ronald Reagan, the eight years leading up to the end. And he's one of the most highly resumed individuals ever to serve in government. His resume is thicker than your phone book. It is my opinion that disclosure starts to be considered under that administration, generally with a view to do it in the second term, uh, because they needed time. You know, the Cold War was just over. I mean, this is kind of a big deal. They needed some time. Uh, my advice would have been do it early in the second term. So you have then the entire rest of the second term to sort of digest it all while you prepare to win the presidency again for your party. I believe it was this loosening uh, and, of, of thinking that ultimately, in one way or another, directly or indirectly, led to the the uh, memoir by Philip Corso, and a number of other things. But as we know, something happened. Something interesting happened. And as the campaign moved toward conclusion, the wheels fell off of George Bush. It was really kind of strange to watch. 
Uh, but it just, it was almost as if something in him said, I can't do this again. But his campaign fell apart, and the election was won by William Clinton, who's here, in case you've forgotten what he looks like, Bill Clinton. And very overnight, we went from a president who was absolutely perfect for the overwhelmingly Republican registered, registered, registered military and intelligence managers and officers who run this cover-up one way or another and a lot of other things to a president who was absolutely antithetical to their thinking and utterly unacceptable as someone who would get a legacy of anything, right? Certainly not the disclosure presidency. And in my opinion, that is one of the reasons why, and I can't prove it, that members of the intelligence community did something they're not allowed to do. They went into the dossiers created for every person that gets within any distance of the presidency. They know it all, but they're not supposed to talk about it unless it's a national security issue. If they discover that a candidate is, in fact, a member of the Communist Party, they're going to come and talk about that. But they discover other stuff, they're not going to talk about it. I think they, they, they broke protocol, and they went in their files, and they handed that stuff over to Richard Mellenscaife, and the right-wing attack on the president began. Not because he was committing adultery. Half of Washington is committing adultery. Not because he had made a few bucks in Whitewater. Most people in Washington laugh. They laugh at Whitewater. As a financial scandal, it's not worthy of 10 seconds of consideration. I believe the principal attacks on Bill Clinton were because this man, very early in the administration, Lawrence Rockefeller, who died just about 10 days ago, approached the administration through his lawyer, Henry Diamond, and said, I want to meet with the president personally. I want to send a report and a letter to him to discuss the bringing forward to the American people the documents surrounding this phenomenon so they decide what's really going on. In other words, Lawrence Rockefeller wanted Bill Clinton to be the disclosure president. That triggered a number of things, not the least of which is Clinton asked Webster Hubble to go and uh, look into it at justice. That was not a smart thing for him to do. Uh, and it was not a good, good, happy thing for Webster because very shortly after he did that and went to see NORAD, called them up, they started indicting Webster for everything, including the sinking of the Maine. As far as I know, he's still under indictment. No, notice what I'm saying here. The principal reason for the attack on Bill Clinton was not because they didn't like his moral behavior. They were petrified that he would be the disclosure president. That's a story you ain't reading in the Washington Post. Now, I could be wrong. Let's get all the information out. Let's get all the people in, Richard Bellenskate and everybody else, sit down, talk about it. Let's see what really happened. If I'm wrong, I'll apologize. Now, while Rockefeller is approaching Clinton, a process that went on for two years. The chief aide, one of the chief aides to him, is this man in the White House, John Podesta. There's no way that John Podesta doesn't know about the Rockefeller Initiative. It's also true that John Podesta is a huge X-Files fan. Everybody knows that. Very interesting guy, very smart, razor sharp mind. So I know John Podesta knew about that. As we know, the Rockefeller initi Initiative slowly phases out while the massive attacks on Clinton continue. But something did happen in addition to briefings and meetings and, 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 and uh, meetings at the ranch between Rockefeller and Clinton and Hillary Clinton. Apparently, according to Whitley Strieber, was opposed to going forward on that. But that was in 95, and I can't blame her. I mean, in 95, the last thing she would, would want her husband to do was to, to get into the UFO business at that point. I mean, his political capital was gone. She knew it. But what happened was is that Podesta was tasked to go out and do some reform of the FOI laws. Not the FOI law, but the, the, the classification laws. And they dumped millions of documents out, not, not about UFOs, but just documents. They sort of got stuff out. It's kind of a little of a bit of a cleansing. I believe that that was sort of a, we can't do what you really would like us to do, but we can do that. Now, some people say, no, 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 it's a coincidence. I don't believe that. It is not a coincidence that Podesta is sitting there, the chief aide, while Rockefeller and all that stuff is going on just down the hall and doesn't know about it. And he is a major X-Files fan, obviously has interest in this subject, and he is tasked to do this. So he had an interest in, in declassification, but that they all go together, right? And while this is all going on, other things start happening, not the least of which is that Stephen Schiff, right 
after the Rockefeller Initiative, just as the Rockefeller Initiative is, is stepping down for reasons that only We'll find out by careful examination of history, though we may never find out because Stephen is no longer with us. He does something remarkable uh, for a congressman. He does his job. Some people in his uh, state said, you know, this is New Mexico and Roswell happened here and this is pretty significant and you're in Congress, would you look into this for us? And he said, I will do that. And he went public with his dissatisfaction and did learn too much. He did learn that many Roswell records were destroyed, which I think embarrassed quite a few people. He was an eight-term congressman. He was a Republican and a conservative. He was a wonderful man, family man, two children, married to his wife for 29 years at that time. And um, he did what he was asked to do by his constituents. He complained when he, he did not get the information he should have gotten. He went public with this, and about 10 months later, he got a squamous cell cancer of the ear, which I've had two, by the way, two squamous cell cancers. Only this one was the squamous cell cancer from hell. They couldn't treat it. Went right into his brain and killed him. Now, forgive me, I think I have something here. Now, I may, what, well, let me just take a little digression. What I have here is Stephen Schiff, late a representative from New Mexico, memorial tributes and addresses. This is a little book that they put together when someone dies in office, Congress. And it consists of various statements uh, by members and so forth. And uh, there was one that I wanted to read you, and I may not be able to find it, so if you don't, it's OK. The point is, is that I got this about uh, six days ago, five days ago, Four days from Marsha Schiff when I had lunch with her in Roswell on the way here. And the reason we had lunch is because I wanted to give her the Paradigm Research Courage and Politics Award that was given to her husband, late husband, at the X conference in April. We had a nice chat. She's a very, very kind of private woman, kind of shy. Uh, she's a former intelligence officer in the Army. Uh, she's getting on with her life, but it's very clear that still very, very painful for her to think about this. And she gave me this tribute book and, uh, and, and, and signed it for me. And uh, when you read this, you find that this is really a great guy. I mean, a really great guy who is very respected by the people there, right? And yet, we know that when he went to the GAO, for Roswell information, that everybody just, well, he entered the ghetto, and now he was part of the group, and they started the normal stuff that they do. And so he be, the attacks began. If a sequel, in fact, I believe a sequel has sort of been done, but we need another one, to Profiles and Courage is written, Stephen Schiff needs to be in it. And hopefully that will happen. So the end result is that the Clinton administration does not get brought down in the first term. He wins a second election to the great surprise of many. And the problem for the government was now we have a lame duck president who's mad as hell, and believe me, he was, all right? The Rockefeller Initiative is just winding down, but something else happened at that point. The politics of disclosure starts to get serious. It was already going on. I mean, there's stuff going on in 92, 93, 94, 95, and various people were getting involved. Stephen Greer is a very important early person. He's obviously still involved. But in 96, things start to heat up particularly the end of 96, early 97. And one of, the, one of the major things that happened is that Art Bell decides that he wants to get this issue on his program. He didn't like politics, but he said, we'll do this. And he started bringing people on the show, including me, to talk about this and to start educating those five, eight, nine million people, not only them, but through the internet, 
about the politics of disclosure, which is now properly called exopolitics. We can't underestimate the impact of this. Simply can't do it. I, had all, I put together about five or six shows. We had multiple guests, Jim Mars, Edgar Mitchell, Lord, so many. Uh, and, and we were totally talking the talk. And um, things started to get interesting. So now the inside group, as far as I'm, they're looking at a lame duck president. They've got this radio show, which is now the, the, the number one late night show in the country. They got all these people coming on with military backgrounds and other stuff, and they're talking politique, real politique. They're talking about disclosure, and they're going, oh no, what if he, you know, what if Bill Clinton decides to pay us back for five years of torture, pain, by being the disclosure president anyway? And so they ratcheted up the attacks and they went for the throat. And they said, we're really going to bring them down this time. Other things started to happen. I talked about them last night. I think that some elements in the government went wet. And for a very dicey period there, from early 97 to late 99, um, we had a whole bunch of people getting heart attacks, heart arrhythmias, cancers, melanoma cancers. So, uh, you know, Reporters like Holloman would, were going out for the store on Saturday morning and deciding that they would have a head-on collision. Even though they were a very safe driver, we had a scientist, shoemaker, he has a head-on collision in the middle of the outback of Australia. How the hell you do that, I don't know. And things were looking a little dicey, and I was trying to follow it as best that I could. Not a damn thing you can do about it, other than follow it, pay attention, which we did. And then it ended in 99, and I believe the en it ended in 99 is because by then it was clear, particularly with the impeachment pending, that. Clinton was not going to disclose, not going to have that happen. Let's stand down. And about the same time, a massive pool of money, and I, and I want to make it very clear, right? I'm going to get you the wrong impression here. My work is nonpartisan, right? I am not here to tell you the extraterrestrials are here, vote for so and so. Believe me, I'm not. If I say something, you're thinking, he's criticizing my guy. I'm not. I'm just saying what I see, not from the standpoint of partisanship, but simply from the standpoint of its relevance to the disclosure process, which is about as nonpartisan as anything could possibly be. All right? About that time in 1999, a massive pool of money starts to be put together, primarily emerging out of Texas, and not coincidentally, I say not coincidentally, and very notably, significantly backed by the corporate managers and principal owners of Clear Channel Communication to elect George W. Bush President of the United States. It was remarkable what was done. They meant business. It is my opinion that their goal was not to elect George W. Bush president. It was to re-elect George H. W. Bush president. If you get my drift, all right? Because the process of disclosure was underway, and they knew that they were going to have to deal with this, and they wanted someone in office that they felt was the right person. The father was not available. The son was. And so he was made president. Right? I say made because he couldn't go out and raise $400 million. Right? A whole lot of other people had to. So, And all presidents are made. Let me, let me, let me make it quite clear. Nobody says, I'm going to be president, puts together a quick campaign, goes out and wins the darn thing. So there's nothing, I'm not making a point here. I'm just saying that a great deal of power and money was committed that he'd be president of the United States, and he was. And as we know, he's been president for three years. So that is important because, again, my view is that disclosure is as much about public relations and legacy as it is many other things. And so if, if, the, if the military and intelligence community is overwhelmingly registered Republican and conservative, if their concerns are national security and order and structure and, and, and things of that nature, they would want a president who they felt would be able to deliver in those areas, respond appropriately. This is not, 
This is not rocket science, right? Okay, so they want, to th they want their president. That's okay. I don't care who's president. Disclosure has to happen. China needed to be open. It didn't matter to me whether it was Nixon or whether it was a Democrat. It needed to be Nixon because a Democrat couldn't have done it. We all know that. It would have been, it would have been a political problem. It would have been dynamite. It would have been huge attacks, and it would have been a mess. But for Clinton to do I say Clinton, forgive me. For Richard Nixon to do it, to go at open China was OK, because everyone knew that he was a super anti-communist. And if he's going to go over there, he wasn't going to give away you know, the ranch. Doesn't matter. Disclosure, regardless. And so in this four years, we've had a president acceptable to them, but we still haven't had disclosure. Well, there have been a few problems in those three years, all right? To make that point quickly, the May 9th press conference was held at the National Press Club, which I assisted in putting on, but it was not my press conference. It was the Disclosure Project press conference, put together about $50,000, and of course, headed by Stephen Greer, was a major event. I've heard all the arguments about it. it wasn't this and it wasn't that. I was there. I know what went on. It was a major event. It will be historically recognized as such. The largest press conference held in the National Press Club, possibly, certainly in, in recent memory. There were 200 people on board. Joel Achenbach said there was 100. I actually counted them. Joel, I think, left early to read some comic books or something. But the point is that he, he got the number wrong. It was 200. There were 17 camera crews, all right? International press, national press, ABC News was there, CBS News was there. By the way, I am very pleased that ABC News is here. Extremely pleased that Peter Jennings sent them. And I think that anybody who wants to should email ABC News and tell them how nice that is and how thoughtful and how wise it is and their appreciation of that. That news conference was major. They had witnesses there, some of which some people don't like. I don't care. There were witnesses there which were solid as rocks. They made very clear statements. That each one said before the camera, I will say all of this in front of Congress under oath, which is a felony. Get you 10, 15 years in Congress. And a tape was presented to another 60 witnesses. Prior to the conference, every member of Congress, com, com, uh, Congress House and Senate, got reports and tape. I helped deliver those. And what many of you don't know is that a very strong contact that we have with NABC News immediately took the tape from that conference and went straight to ABC News Nightline and gave it to Ted Koppel, who I have been approaching met with his editors and providing information to for eight solid years. Nobody has gotten, no program has gotten more information put forth in front of them, offers of meetings than Nightline. Number one, all right? And later that night, I got a call from this contact who basically said, okay, Nightline has said, decided that they will vet six of these witnesses, give us the names, and we'll start the vetting process leading to something, right? And we gave him six names, and we tossed in Edgar Mitchell for seven. And shortly thereafter, a week or two, I learned that they had decided to start with John Callahan. And they were sort of gearing up for the vetting of John Callahan. I mean, they weren't, they weren't, you know, weren't rushing. I mean, they, they didn't go run screaming out of the building and say, all right, here we go. No, no, they're taking their time. It takes time to digest this stuff, right? This, this isn't just... This is not something the news people can say, boom, here's a story, let's go tomorrow. No, 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 no. They've got to digest it, right? Of course, they've been digesting an awful long time. And so we waited a few more months to see what was going to happen. And four months, practically to the day of the May 9th press conference, some fine citizens of the nation of Saudi Arabia decided to use their skills, their aviation skills, not their landing skills, just their aviation skills, to inflict damage on our country. And all of the momentum of that major press conference ended. OK, that's life. All right, I accept that. Not a problem. Thus ended the possibility of disclosure in George W. Bush's first term. Which brings us to now. And it brings us to, in this case, Three individuals, John Kerry, the senator from Massachusetts, 
the incumbent president, and Dennis Kucinich. And I'm going to take this opportunity, if you will indulge me, to make a public statement to these gentlemen, right here at MUFON, all right? Because this is what you gotta do. You have to be unambiguous, you have to ask the questions, you have to make clear what you want, you have to do it publicly, and then, you know, you, you're supposed to get lots of great interviews and, and stuff. It doesn't seem to happen, but this still gets, has to get done. So, and by the way, there is one other candidate, what I call mainline frontline candidate, that is not included in this statement, and that is Ralph Nader. And the reason that is, is that Dennis Kucinich can't win, and Ralph Nader can't win. But Dennis Kucinich knows about this issue, and Dennis Kucinich's worldview allows this issue. Ralph Nader has refused every effort to look at this subject, to consider this subject. He has his other issues. I, I honor that. But there's nothing to say to him. It would be a waste of time. So this is the statement. The next president of the United States will take office during the 57th year of the public's awareness of a government-imposed truth embargo on the fact of an extraterrestrial presence engaging the planet Earth and the human race. This awareness began with the withdrawal of the retrieved saucer explanation by General Roger Ramey and the substitution of a weather balloon to account for the events in early July 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. Later that year, the superstructure for the embargo was created with the passage of the National Security Act and the assembling of a management team titled Majestic 12 Group. This truth embargo has left a massive hole in the worldview of every living human being. It has created two parallel realities, one with an accepted extraterrestrial hypothesis and one without. It has broken the social contract, compromised the mission of NASA, eroded trust in government, withheld life and environmental enhancing technology, and warped the relationship between two branches of government, executive and legislative, and the military intelligence community. The extraordinary requirement to service this embargo while simultaneously prosecuting the Cold War, a 45-year ideological conflict unlike anything the world had ever seen, resulted in the creation of a secret empire, the intelligence components of the military-industrial complex. It is, it is an empire because it is vast in size and power, and no part of it is elected. It is composed of fiefdoms run by career managers who are replaced internally when they retire or die. While agency directors are publicly appointed by presidents, the directors of corporate intelligence operations are not public and operate in a hybrid world of government classification and corporate proprietary self-interest. The public interest oversight of this complex, larger on the basis of its known budget than the total military spending of every nation on Earth except the United States, which is $420 billion, lies with the House and Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. But as the secret empire has grown, both the effectiveness and public trust in members of Congress and Congress as a functioning institution have diminished. Committee members are quick to say they have things under control. But each year, few Americans believe them, or for that matter, care or pay attention. Organized citizen efforts toward secrecy reform, while well-meaning, have been minimal, with little or no funding. Attempts by the executive branch to reform, restructure, or limit the secret empire have been inadequate, misdirected, and disdainfully rebuffed. Ironically, the sheer size of this complex has contributed to numerous failures to take care of business. While the secret empire has successfully tended to its own agendas, kept its own secrets, managed public opinion, and conducted domestic campaigns of surveillance, subversion, misinformation, and propaganda, it has often failed in matters of its primary function to protect and defend the United States. When you have millions of people with multi-levels of clearance to assign and track, hundreds of millions of documents to classify, thousands of overt and covert projects to manage, vast underground facilities to build and maintain, equally vast above-ground facilities to secure, it would seem that foreign enemies of the state slip through the cracks. 
These instances have been well documented and don't need to be addressed here. The response to each intelligence blunder is the same. Demands for more money, more secrecy, and more power. Size befitting failures begetting greater size. There are four men still campaigning for the presidency who are high profile, mainstream candidates. Two have a chance to win and two are trying to either make a statement or influence the election. None are likely to say anything, nothing about the secret empire or take any position on real secrecy reform beyond mistakes were made pre and post 911. This issue, like many others, is off limits. And the willingness of American people to accept limited debate and exposition is now a threat to the nation. But there is hope, because millions of Americans have become aware and informed of the actions and implications of the secret empire through their interest in extraterrestrial-related phenomena. They are increasingly networked and now form a substantial voting block. They are educated, well-read, cyber-savvy, and many have military backgrounds. They are starting to put pressure on candidates to take a position on the most controversial and implicative issue in the world today. On their behalf, the following open memos to three of these four candidates are posted. Bush and Kerry because either could win, and Kucinich because his worldview already embraces the possibility of an extraterrestrial presence. Nader is left out because he can't win and has no interest in extraterrestrial related phenomena. Memo to President Bush. The day you stepped into the White House as the 43rd President of the United States, you stood on the threshold of perhaps the greatest legacy offered any head of state in history. Ten years after the end of the Cold War, you could be the leader who ended the truth embargo and informed the nation and the world of the extraterrestrial presence engaging the planet. You could be the disclosure president. Millions of people around the world then watched closely to see if you would deliver on your promise to Charles Huffer, a MUFON member, by the way, during an exchange in a 2000 campaign stop in Arkansas, CNN recorded the moment. Huffer to the president. Half the public believes they are real. Would you finally tell us what the hell is going on? Bush, sure I will. Huffer, gesturing to Vice Presidential Candidate Cheney, was stepping up at that moment. This man knows he was Secretary of Defense. Bush, and was a great one. Later, Huffer encountered off camera in the hall, the president, who recognized Huffer, an unsolicited set, and I got this directly from Charles. It will be the first thing he, pointing to Cheney, will do. He'll get right on it. Huffer, will, will you really? Bush, yes, sir. Truly, it has been a difficult three and a half years, a tough time for the nation and for your administration. History has called upon you in other ways with other challenges. But the disclosure legacy was and still is yours to claim in part because your father was held in highest regard by the military and intelligence communities, the exact opposite circumstance from the intervening Clinton administrations. The election this November is now problematic. If you do not take up the disclosure mantle, it may be lost to you and your party forever. The truth embargo cannot last four more years. More ranking military and agency employees will come forward. The media complicity will end. History calls, Mr. President. Answer the call. Memo to Senator Kerry. The television talking heads that analyze your campaign repeatedly refer to the need for you to define yourself to the electorate and separate yourself from George W. Bush during an era when a significant segment of the public sees little difference between the two principal political parties while referring to republicrats. Should you choose to take this good advice, you might begin by repudiating your membership in the absurd and dangerous secret society, Skull and Bones, rather than laugh off or refuse to answer questions from the press regarding this Kabbalistic organization which exists for no other reason than to network power among selected elite, the American people no longer find this funny or irrelevant. More importantly, while it is inconceivable, given the restricted and scripted nature of the modern election campaign, you would speak to or seriously answer questions about extraterrestrial-related phenomena, there is something you should know. 
the truth embargo, or cover-up, preventing a formal acknowledgement of the extraterrestrial presence, disclosure, is unraveling due to the emergence of military and agency witnesses since the end of the Cold War. Should you take office on January 21st, 2005, this in truth embargo becomes your concern. And the legacy of the disclosure presidencies, yours to claim or reject. Do not accept a need to know explanation from the DOD, NSA, or CIA for their refusal to give you the information you need to make a disclosure decision. Each day of your term that passes without you stepping forward and ending this five decade charade, that legacy will slowly fade away and you and your political party will begin to own the cover up. A new year, a new president, a new world. Dear Congressman Kucinich, six high profile Democratic Party candidates in the 2004 presidential campaign have fallen away. But you continue because you believe you have something to say to the American people and to your party convention. Your supporters and staff have worked very hard to give you this opportunity to have an impact. You are clearly a man apart. There is no one else in the United States Congress like you. No one who thinks further outside the box. Consequently, you have brought many innovative ideas and positions on issues into the campaign. Of particular note are your views regarding war, peace, nonproliferation, and weapons in space. These are issues of great importance, which if not resolved soon, may yet lead to worldwide, worldwide calamity. And this raises a troubling question. How is it remotely possible for the governments of the world to reach decisions about war, peace, non-proliferation, and the weaponization of space, and a host of other related matters, when the truth of an extraterrestrial presence is being kept completely out of public discourse? Congressman Kucinich, you can make history. Step forward and speak to this matter. Lift the curtain of ridicule. Finish what candidate Jimmy Carter could not finish in 1976. Be the first presidential candidate with a spot at a party convention to place the most important issue in the world before the nation. Millions of people around the planet will stand and applaud true political courage. These are my statements to the candidates. Now, I promised somebody last night that I was going to do this, so I'm going to do it right now. Now, I want you to take, by the way, how much time have I got? Who knows? No, no, no. I really need to know. What time is it? 10 of 12. 10 of 12. Okay, I think I have to, 12.15? Uh, All right, whatever. They'll tell me. Somebody will emerge out of that curtain, grab me, wrestle me to the ground. That'll be the end. You'll know. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, but I, I, first of all, I want you to take a moment, okay? In other words, I want you to think about the question, all right? Don't just respond. I'm not looking for cheap support here. I'm not, I'm not looking for, for uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not looking, you know, just for moral support. I want you to give me your honest answer, okay? So first, I'm going to give you the question. I want you to take a little bit of time to think about it, and then I'm going to ask you your answer. The question is fairly simple. Can I, if it's possible, it's not critical, but if it's possible to raise the lights in the room first for a couple of minutes and then take them back down, I'd appreciate it, right? So if you could raise the lights while I ask this question, it would be kind of cool, right? And then we'll take them back down, all right? This is the question. Based upon what you know now, based upon what you believe is important, based upon your worldview, all right. Are you in favor of the United States government holding a press conference and announcing the presence of extraterrestrials engaging the planet? It is a simple question. It's not a complicated question. Based on what you know, are you in favor of the disclosure event? All right. Hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. All right. All right, you've had a moment to think about this. All right, I only want honest answers here, folks. 
Those who are in favor of this event taking place forthwith, raise your hands. All right, everyone look around and see the number of hands raised. It is a significant portion of this audience. Thank you. All right. You can bring the, you can bring the lights back down, please. I'd like the uh, size. Let me go back up here for a second. Okay. The trend is obvious. The polls go all the way back to the 40s. We are now up to this level in the polling. Anonymous, whether you're a scientist or a government person, duck tea or whatever. It's an anonymous poll. No one's going to know who you are. Roper's done it. Time has done it. CNN has done it. Reuters has done it. Do you think UFOs are, are, are a function of extraterrestrial phenomena? 50% yes. Is the government lying to you? 80, 85, 90% yes. Recently, I had another question. Are abductions taking place because of extraterrestrial activities? 20% yes. And if the question is asked, and it will be in a poll very soon, like I ask here, are you in favor of the government telling the fundamental truth of an extraterrestrial presence? Which is a question, obviously, that anybody can answer, whether you, you believe it or not. Right? Meaning, I, I don't know anything about it, but if they are, tell me. I think it's going to pull in somewhere around 70%. Why is this a problem? It's really simple, OK? When the public gets those kinds of numbers on an issue and says that this is what I think and this is what's going on, and the government says, no, none of it is going on, you have a stress on the social contract. And if it goes on long enough, it will break. And you say, well, no, 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 the social contract's not going to break. The government would never take misrepresentation or disinformation to a level that would break the social contract. Keeping in mind that I am not partisan, the simple truth, without being partisan, and I really believe this, is that for the umpteenth time, the United States government, the great, wonderful government, the great nation that I love, was born into, went to the American people and it said, we need to do this, and this is why. And the information was wrong. And so consequently, actions took place and people lost their lives based upon false information. And so I, it is my firm belief that while the social contract is not broken for the American people, for the parents of some of these lost in the Middle East, it is broken. Because if you come to the American people with truth and they say, fine, go ahead, the contract is solid. But if you lie and then you send their son or daughter to die, you have broken that contract. Now, I happen to believe, just to balance this out, that if the government, our leaders, had come and said exactly what the reality was and said why they needed to do this war, I happen to believe that the Congress would have given the executive branch the go-ahead, and the American people would have supported it. I happen to believe that. Now, others don't believe it. They say, no, they wouldn't have. Fine. The issue, of course, is that we didn't have that choice. We didn't have the truth, so we didn't have that choice. It is my contention that this penchant, this irrepressible need to lie when the truth would probably serve, this fundamental problem that we see everywhere in the FBI and the CIA and all kinds of agencies, whistleblower stories, we can go on forever. It is a, it is a growing disease that is emerging out of this dysfunctional national security state. That when you, when you start in 90, 1947, whatever the good intent, and, and th th these were very serious people back then with, with very serious intent, and you start a cover-up of that magnitude and you maintain it for 50 years, it, it just seeps out and starts to change the mindset of people in government. And they say, you know, this, this embargo thing is pretty cool. 
boy, it makes things a lot easier, right? You need to build a you know, million square foot underground base in, uh, in, 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 in Arizona. It's a lot harder if you've got to file those pesky environmental state, impact statements, or you've got to go to, the, to the, the, the state legislature and say, we want to build a site. I mean, you just do it. You don't tell anybody. And then when people ask if it's there, you tell them it's not there. It's so easy. And so after 50 years, you're doing it all the time. And after you've done it so much, people say, look, nobody in the damn government is ever going to tell me the truth, so I don't even care anymore. And so you say, I'm not even going to vote. So in the last election, 76% of Americans didn't vote. So now we have a situation where the government gives bad information to the nation to go to war. Okay, The government that is doing this was elected by only 19%. I'm sorry. Nine, let me get this right now. It was elected by only 12.5% of the American people. And one of the principal reasons we're going there, again, I'm not being partisan here, was to create a democracy where one didn't exist. I happen to think that's a, not a bad idea. But what troubles me is that the nation that is forcing that democracy with all of the collateral damage and loss of life is a nation where 24% vote and 76% don't. What democracy are we talking about here? So there's a lot of blame to go around. The national security state is breeding a government that is endemically and pathologically lying and a citizenship that is dropping out. Don't vote, don't care, don't act. This is not good, folks. And a lot of people say, you know, well, it's not a problem for me. I'm happy. I got a nice life. I got a nice job. I'm cruising around. I, I'm out in Colorado. Nothing's happening. That's true. For a lot of people, it's not a problem. But on a very nice morning, right, for those people who are sitting at their desk having a croissant who looked out the window and saw a 747 coming directly at them, it was a problem. And they were going I think one of the things that, last things that went through their mind is somebody screwed up here. Something is wrong here. They never will know, probably never will know, that it's not just that some bad guys jumped in a plane, but because there is a systemic imbalance that is warping nations and policies. And that imbalance is, comes from many sources, but not the least of which is that the planet is being gazed by extraterrestrials and the government's world say, what extraterrestrials? And the people are going, you've got to be kidding. This has got to stop, folks. It isn't about, gee, we're going to be able to take a ride in a saucer. It's about much, much more than that. And because you happen to be in the front line and are extremely knowledgeable, whether you wanted it or not, boy, you have got a serious load of responsibility, you and thousands more like you. You know. So if I'm right about this, you got to act. You can't just go, I'll wait and see how it turns out. <laughs> Let me see what I'm doing here. 12 o'clock. I think that's, that's an hour and 50 minutes. I bet I'm almost done. How much time have I got? Five minutes. <laughs> oh, boy. That's a problem. Um, okay, well, look, we'll all have to meet up in my suite. Uh, we'll complete this then. We had a pretty big suite, by the way. John really blew my mind. I mean, I, I'm never going to be able to go back to Motel 6. <laughs> That's for darn sure. All right, tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch. I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to the finish here, and the, and the finish is about MUFON. All right, I'm going to talk about MUFON very quickly. I don't, I don't belong to MUFON. As I told you, I, don't, I never joined any organization because it was the right thing to do for the kind of work that I do. I was going to talk about that, by the way, but you don't need that before breakfast, I mean before lunch. I would like to make a modest proposal to MUFON that it change its mission statement. Make a few mid-course corrections here. Not that it's not doing a lot of great things. It is. We know that. I've said that. And here's why. In a few words. I got a whole hour on this, but I'm going to give it a few words. MUFON needs to reassert itself as the preeminent organization in the world on this. And it needs to grow very rapidly, very fast. I think 100,000 members is appropriate. And not in six years, but immediately. Why? Do we need 97,000 more investigators of sightings and extraterrestrial phenomena? No, we do not. All right. 
What we need is an international organization that is prepared to step forward and exert as much influence as possible to resolve the political impasse. And MUFON can do it. And one of the reasons is the fact that there is a huge misunderstanding in America about the advocacy potential of 5013Cs, which generally are thought to give away their ability to advocate when they accept that tax write-off for contributions. In fact, it's not true. They have enormous ability to advocate. But that information has been withheld. Because if people knew that, they'd start advocating. And the people in Washington don't need you advocating. Right? They got their people they deal with. They got some very powerful individuals. They want to deal with them. They don't want to deal with a bunch of people with their issues. How many of you ever heard of the 1976 IRS law that created Section H? Never heard of it, have you? That law essentially corrected a serious imbalance in the 5013C laws. And it said, here is the criteria you, you use for what you can do in terms of lobbying, lobbying now, advocacy, and direct political action. You keep your books carefully, and you separate anything you do that is defined as lobbying, and you don't exceed 20% of your budget. And it turns out, and if you do that, you're clear. And it turns out that because the, the definition of lobbying is fairly narrow, for instance, general education is not a problem. You can do it all day long. You can go to the Senate and hand them papers and stuff all day long and a lot of other things. That most of the advocating that a 5013C do wouldn't fall under that. So it's almost impossible for a 5013C to violate Section H of the 1976 Act. And what that means, and again, I apologize if I'm seeming presumptuous, is that MUFON, if it were to have 100,000 members with the two or three million dollars coming in that that represents, could go to Washington and kick butt and maintain its 5013C, all right? We've done investigations, and I do not in any way imply that those investigations shouldn't continue, but what we need now is advocacy in large numbers. MUFON is in the best position to do this, to go to the public and say, we need you to join right now, not because we need you to go up to Saskatchewan and look into a sighting there in a trailer park out in the woods, because we need you to make this organization a political power. Now, other 5013Cs know this, the big ones, the heavy ones, but the small ones don't, because they are definitely not told. They don't want you to know this. And I could go on about PACs and stuff that they don't want you to know stuff about. All I can say is the game plan is simple. We created laws that would allow the general public to really influence Washington, but we don't want them to use those laws. We will we'll, we'll tell you those laws are evil or whatever. Please don't use them. But we did create them because we're using them, OK? We're a $400 billion company. We're a massive advocacy group. We're using them to death. But we don't want you to do them, OK? Because you could actually have influence. So I, my proposal is. MUFON add a powerful political advocacy component to what it does. That it go to the public and say, if you join now, we can, because of our enormous prestige, our longevity, our international reach, we can truly, like ARP and like the NAACP and countless other 5013Cs, we can influence policy. We can possibly bring about disclosure, and we can certainly be a factor in the post-disclosure world in case the government comes forward and says, yes, the ETs are here. Now shut up and leave us alone. We'll get back to you in a couple of decades. And you want to say, uh-uh, we want it now. And they're going to say, well, what are you going to do about it? And you're going to say, well, we got 500,000 members here. And what we're going to do about it is we're going to unelect about 500 of you and send you back to run a used car dealership. And you're going, oh, now you got our attention. That's my modest proposal. Please give it your consideration. I'm done. Thank you. Oh, really? You shouldn't. Oh, come up to my suite. <laughs>